We come today to the conclusion of the beautiful sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, the chapter that contains the Bread of Life discourse in which our Lord teaches in a very strong and clear way, I am the bread of life. And unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. At the conclusion of this sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, the question before us is, do you believe? Do you believe in the real and substantial presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? Because many today do not. They have abandoned that teaching and regard the Holy Eucharist as merely a symbol. Those who heard Jesus preaching the Bread of Life discourse some had trouble with his words. We learn at the conclusion of John chapter 6 that many of his followers scattered to the four winds, never to follow him again, because they found those words too difficult. And when our Lord saw his followers leaving, because of the strong words that he said about the bread of life, and unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. When he saw them leaving, what did he do? Did he chase after them and say, no, 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 come back. I was just speaking metaphorically. It's just a symbol. No. Rather, he asks those who remain his beloved 12, are you going to leave too? And St. Peter spoke for himself, and he spoke for the 12, and he spoke for the church, and I sure hope he speaks for you and me when he said to our Lord, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of everlasting life. The question before us today, do you believe in the Eucharist? We are strengthened today by the example of Joshua, the great hero of the Old Testament who stood proudly before his people and said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we are strengthened today by the testimony and the example of someone known for his heroic virtue. I want to tell you a story. It's a story that I had made plans to tell you a month and a half ago as I mapped out the five weeks of John chapter 6, those five weeks that we're coming to the end of, in which the focus is very clearly on the Eucharist. A month and a half ago, I decided I would tell you this story, a story that I have told dozens of times, especially during those seven years when as a priest I traveled around giving conferences and missions. A month and a half ago, I had no idea that the context of the story that I'm going to tell you would bear a haunting resemblance to the events of this past week. I want to tell you today about a hero of mine. Maybe you've never heard his name, but I'll tell you about him today. His name is Francois Nguyen Van Thuan. It's a Vietnamese name. His heroic virtue was recently recognized by the Church Universal. He is properly called the Venerable Francois Nguyen Van Thuan. 
The next step, please God, will be his beatification. And I pray that I'll live long enough to see him canonized and raised to the altars as a saint. Who is Francois Nguyen Van Thuan? A Vietnamese priest who became a bishop. And in the spring of 1975, he was named Archbishop of Saigon. Saigon, spring of 1975. A few days after his installation, Saigon fell to the forces of communism. A few days after that, the archbishop was arrested and put in jail. He would spend the next 13 years of his life in prison, nine of which were spent in solitary confinement. At the end of those 13 years, he would be exiled, never to see his homeland again. He would go to Rome, and there he would be named Cardinal by St. John Paul II. He would die in the year 2002. In his memoirs, the Archbishop wrote, At the moment I was arrested, there was only one question on my mind. Would I ever be able to say Mass again? At the moment of his arrest, only one thing was in mind, whether he would experience ever again the Holy Eucharist. Now the prisoners were able to write to their family and ask for personal items like toothbrushes. The Archbishop wrote to his family and said, please send me medicine for my stomach ache. His family knew exactly what he meant. On a medicine bottle, they wrote medicine for stomach ache. And they filled the container with altar wine. And in a, in a flashlight, they removed one of the batteries and they replaced the batteries with unconsecrated hosts. When the prison guard received that package and opened it in the presence of the archbishop, he picked up the little bottle and he asked the archbishop, do you have a stomach ache? The archbishop said, yes, because every fiber of his being was longing for the Holy Eucharist. That night, after lights out, the archbishop would do what he would do every night he was in prison. After lights out, prone on his mat, with a fraction of a host in the palm of one hand, and in the other, three drops of wine mixed with one drop of water, he would recite from memory the prayers of the Mass, changing bread and wine into the very body and blood of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Archbishop would later write, these were the happiest masses of my life because in these masses I could relate so closely to the suffering Lord, the one who himself was betrayed by his own people and unjustly condemned, the one who himself spent time a night in prison and who suffered in his body and in his spirit. The Archbishop said, these were the happiest masses of my life because through them I could relate most closely 
with our suffering Lord. Now it didn't take too long before the other prisoners realized that their archbishop was in prison with them and Catholics arranged to sleep next to him so that during the mass the archbishop could distribute holy communion to them from underneath the mosquito net that now served as his cathedral. Those who were already alive in their faith became passionate for their faith. Those who were lukewarm suddenly were on fire for the Lord. And those who at the beginning couldn't care one way or the other somehow fell in love with the Lord and grew in their devotion to him. The prisoners who were not Christian, many of them asked the archbishop to be baptized so that they could receive Holy Communion. And the Archbishop, of course, obliged. Some of the devout Catholics asked the Archbishop if there might be time to extend Holy Communion through adoration, spending time in prayer before the reserved Blessed Sacrament. The Archbishop wasn't sure how he could do this because, of course, there was no chapel, there was no altar, there was no tabernacle. He came up with the solution. He had one of the parishioners, one of the prisoners, fashioned for him out of rice paper, a sturdy envelope. And at the end of Mass, he would place a consecrated host into the envelope and give it to one of the trusted Catholic prisoners who would carry it in his shirt close to his heart and he would walk the prison yard all day long and the prisoners would see him and they would know that they were not alone they knew that the Lord was in solidarity with their suffering and with their isolation and with their imprisonment. And they grew in their joy for the Lord by the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. The Archbishop would write that the darkness of that horrible prison was scattered by the paschal light of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Jesus Christ, the light come into the world and the darkness shall not overcome it. At one of the conferences that I was delivering, I told this same story. I noticed in the back of the room were two gentlemen who were Vietnamese. I asked after the conference was over, I asked them, have you ever heard of Archbishop Francois Nguyen Van Thuan? One of the Vietnamese gentlemen, very gre gregarious in his personality, said, oh yes, oh yes, I am from Saigon. He was my archbishop. And then he elbowed his friend, a very humble man who did not make eye contact with me out of a sign of respect but I will never ever forget his words. He told me, I once walked the prison yard in Saigon, carrying in my pocket a rice paper envelope containing the most holy Eucharist. Do you believe do you believe in the power of the Holy Eucharist? Do you believe in the real and substantial presence of Jesus? Something that he teaches us in John chapter 6. This is the question. When we think about the life of Venerable Francois Wynne Van Thuan, we come to realize that the forces of evil that imprisoned him 
continue to operate in full force in our own day and age. Those forces of evil are in full view on the streets of Kabul in the terror being inflicted by the Taliban upon innocent women and men, girls and boys. The same evil of communism continues to keep the church in Vietnam under close scrutiny and painstaking control. The building of new churches and the admission of a young man into seminary takes place only with the express permission of the communist government. And the government is not very generous at all. Even in our own country, the evils of Marxism have been creeping steadily into our laws, our schools, and our culture with truth, virtue, and decency being sacrificed upon the altars of relativism, hedonism, and nihilism. These are difficult times in which we live. All around us, there is uncertainty, confusion, and a diminishing sense of confidence about what the future will bring. These are dark days. And perhaps there are darker days to come. We do well in these dark days. And whether the darkness is something that you associate with national and international news or some darkness in your own life because of the tragedy of sin or a broken relationship, when we think about the darkness, we do well to remember that dismal, dank, bleak prison in Saigon and how the darkness of that prison gave way to the bright light shining from the Holy Eucharist, the real presence of the Lord, the one who is the light. And the darkness will never overcome the light. May we never wander from the Holy Eucharist. May our faith, enlivened by the words of Joshua and the example of Venerable Francois Wynne Van Tuan, may our faith in these difficult times give rise from our own hearts to the words of St. Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of everlasting life.